I would see, you know, 3D, I would see like, uh, you know, some three-dimensional rendering, AR, I would see physical models, I would see drawings, and uh, this ability, what happened? Okay. Uh, Elena? Yes. So somebody, okay, uh, okay, oh, somebody else. I'm okay. here. This, yeah, it's okay, there's somebody else uh, suddenly took off. So this ability to use all the different media is to me was one of the most unique things, right? I don't think there's any other field today which does it. Um, so I'm happy to share with you a bit about Instagram, uh, both Instagram as a communication platform, and also to talk a bit about uh, big data and the use of big data in uh, cultural and social research. Because along with Instagram, right, which is a kind of photo media, but also narrative media, uh, I mean, big data, right? It's another kind of, in a way, type of media or type of resource you can use. So I'm going to um, show some projects uh, we have created in my lab, uh, where we try to kind of approach Instagram's big data in different ways. And I'll also say a few things about this research to give you examples of what our scientists and our labs are doing. Uh, and also share a few theoretical ideas about both advantages and limitations of big data and what I see as a main challenge in this kind of big data turn, uh, which was going, you know, which happened in the late 2000s, where the ability to collect, analyze, uh, and make decisions based on kind of big data about human behaviors both physical behaviors, right, in cities, uh, car movements, with data captured by sensors, but also data such as, you know, your social media posts, blogs, and so on, have really created, you know, yet another revolution in society, right? Uh, so let's take a look. So I'm going to share the screen. Okay. Okay. So you guys can see, right? Good. Okay, so this is just a few things about me. And... Uh, I think you will understand why my dream has always been like to go to a Sayara and just like sit in the corner and just work. Uh, because as I said, right, I'm very attracted to the Sayark kind of style of research and student works, which combines the analytical and the creative. And now you can see why, right, uh, why I feel at home. So I was born in Moscow, uh, right, Russia, uh, where I actually studied uh, art and architecture. I was a student in the Moscow Architecture Institute for two years. So I'm actually kind of like half-trained architect. Um, when we immigrated to America, so I came to Europe in 1981, uh, I decided that I want to work with time. So I went to NYU Film School. Uh, then I was a PhD student in, con in, a new, in a cognitive science and eventually got PhD in visual culture. Right, so I studied different things, but I also worked in computer graphics and computer animation and visual effects uh, between 1984 and 1992. And, we, and in fact, the reason they took me, right, because at that time in 1984, there were only seven companies in the world which could do 3D, you know, 3D computer graphics and visual effects. So the reason they took me is because we actually had architecture education, right? So we said, well, you know, we will take you because you can think in 3D, which of course also is very relevant because as you know, some architects love LA, right? They'll even move to LA so they can work with various visual effects studios and et cetera, et cetera. So now the connection, right, between visual effects, 3D, uh, kind of like creation of virtual worlds, right, for movies and games and architecture is very strong. Uh, so also very relevant. And then uh, for 20 years, I was a professor of digital art in the visual art department. And when I really got into data science, I said, okay, so data science, right, the big data, it's a new, it's yet another stage in the computerization of society and it creates all kinds of creative possibilities, but it also uh, becomes a new kind of way to acquire knowledge, right? So there are very serious issues like surveillance, you know, privacy, uh, and also just decision-making based on data. So I said, in order for me to write it, I have to study it. So 10 years ago, I didn't even know how to use Excel. So I completely learned myself by just reading online tutorials. Then I learned R, uh, which maybe some of you know, 
It's a leading kind of open source language for data analysis. And then I was invited to New York and I became professor of computer science. Right? So I'm basically a professor in a PhD program in computer science. I have never taken a single computer science class in my life. Just learn it, right, online. Um, so let's uh, now look at uh, some content, okay? Good. Um, let's see if it's actually going to work here. It works. Okay, you can see the screen still, right? Yeah, okay. Um, so, um, so data science is a term uh, which emerged uh, in the late, uh, which became popular in the late 2000s. It's a big umbrella terms, umbrella term, which refers to different kind of disciplines and also different skills which you need to work with data. So it includes statistics, uh, it includes newer methods of data analysis, it also includes kind of technical skills, you know, how to install and run software systems, which are processing kind of billions of, you know, data records per minute. Uh, and it's also analyzing data, kind of making conclusions, creating visualizations. So it's an umbrella term. So uh, in fact, uh, if you look at where data science is used, uh, it's also used to analyze contemporary culture. And uh, in fact, you realize that this analysis of contemporary culture as data, it really has become a foundation of contemporary kind of culture industry, entertainment, uh, leisure, and so on. Right? So there are companies which are doing marketing research, uh, looking at consumer preferences, using data to do product development, and the analysis of online and physical behaviors. Like for example, there's a company that chooses satellite images and looks at how much oil is like on oil tanks, right? To kind of figure out oil production. And uh, we do it by taking satellite images, right? Zooming in on the kind of oil tanks, and we're using computer vision to automatically measure how much oil is there, right? There are big, uh, big, you know, big companies like Arup, uh, which are using um, various data about people movements, you know, car movements, and so on, right? To figure out uh, patterns of, kind of human movements in particular areas, even using it to, perhaps to propose some urban schemes. Uh, and then there's you know, a bunch of bunch of different fields. Uh, among these fields, there is like one or two which emerged also in the late 2000s. Uh, sometimes they're called urban informatics, right? Um, and the data is also used in urban planning. Uh, so I would give you kind of a few examples, you know, before we go to Instagram, just to show you that like the kind of work I've been doing on Instagram is not isolated phenomena. It's a part of this very broad movement, a very broad paradigm. And you can find these examples of interesting analysis of culture as data in lots of fields, in popular media, in exhibitions, and so on. So this is one example. It's a, it's a kind of a multimedia story created by New York Times, right? So it was published a couple of, uh, couple of years ago. So we have used Spotify. So Spotify, right, has data on uh, like 30 or 40 million songs. And for every song, Spotify uses uh, computer algorithms to extract various properties of a song, right, to measure different properties. And these properties are stored. And you can access it, right? So, so Spotify has API. So anybody can go and access these properties. So that's what uh, New York Times have done. So we, uh, I think Spotify measures 14 different properties from every song. I mean, how do you measure it? Well, you can take a song, you break it into very small intervals, 100 milliseconds, when you measure its properties, right? Um, so we, we use properties of loudness, energy, sensibility, uh, what, what Spotify calls acousticness. Uh, so that's the song uses acoustical instruments in also violence, how cheerful it is, right? And then you can represent every song as this kind of shape in this five-dimensional five five space, right? So every song becomes like a signature in the space of five dimensions, okay? So then what we've done is we took all the uh, summer hits in America for, you know, 60, 60 years. Uh, so each of us, right, each of us kind of circle is uh, all, the, all the songs 
uh, which we hit in a particular summer. And now every song is presented, right, as the shape. And uh, by simply superimposing the shapes, even if you don't use statistics, even if you don't measure anything, you see that there are some changes in variability. Right? So we have, you can actually measure it, right? So there's simple statistical measures of variability. You can also measure variability of any, any city, any, or any, any part of the city, right? Or, you know, um, right? So variability or diversity, it's actually something you can measure. So here we're measuring variability of a song during you know, each summer. And uh, uh, what, we're, what we're seeing is that over time, the songs of each summer, which we, we hit, became more and more similar. Okay? So in fact, if you plot this, right, if you plot this, uh, you get something like this, right? So if, if the points which are at the bottom, it means that you know, they're kind of more diverse. And as the points go up, it means that uh, with less diversity, so each point now corresponds, right? So for each point, you take this bunch of circles for each summer and measure the you know, variability and simply represent it as one point, right? So now you get a graph which shows you something very interesting, right? It shows you a long-term pattern in a particular cultural field, you know, which is popular music, how uh, during this period from 1970 to 2010, Right. There is a very slow uh, uh, change where the songs become less diverse. Okay. Now imagine if you can get this kind of data about every building in thousand cities worldwide. And you can also invent some mathematical measure of similarity or difference, the measure of variability. Okay, maybe you know, maybe you have pretty architectural plans, maybe you measure facades. I don't know, maybe you look at materials, maybe you look at urban plants. And then you can also do this kind of research and see, right, if our cities became more variable, less variable, how this variability is different between different continents, and so on. Right? So this is the idea of cultural analytics, and that's why I created my lab in 2005, because I realized that uh, the, the, the availability of big cultural data in different fields, and the fact that computers can become faster at this point, uh, will allow me in many hours to do this kind of research. Right? So now one more example, just to show you how the same kind of paradigm can be used in, to look at different types of culture. So this is a you know, very well-known article from 2017. It was published in, uh, in Science. No, sorry, it was published in Nature, I think. Nature is the most prestigious scientific magazine. If you, if you basically Chinese computer scientist, uh, no, sorry, if you're, if you're Chinese computer student and you publish one paper in Nature, right? Like the government pays you $40,000, right? That's how prestigious it is. And you immediately get like a job in a good university. Uh, so you wouldn't expect kind of research about humanities and cultures to be published in the top scientific journal but now we do it uh, because we realize that, uh, this is my interpretation, right? There is so much data about culture now that in some ways you can now study culture as a kind of science, right? You can look for general cultural patterns the way physicists or chemists or biologists would can study uh, general patterns in a kind of non-biological or biological matter, right? Um, so what happens here, right? So we got a database, uh, which according to them includes half a million artists, so half a million artists, which is all the artists which had at least like one show, you know, in a kind of commercial art gallery uh, during the last 30 years. In reality, when I look at the data, it turns out it wasn't complete. You know, we didn't have Eastern Europe, we didn't have Asia, uh, but the paper was published anyway. Let, anyway, anyway, so what did we do? So we um, used network science, right? So network science is another part of contemporary science, right? You know, the study of networks, like Facebook is a network, right? Instagram is a network, friends and so on, right? I mean, you can measure you know, urban area as a kind of network, right? Of streets, connections, right? So network science, it's a very 
important intellectual tool today. So we have used network science. So create a network of all these galleries and artists and museums, right? And by kind of tracking careers of artists, kind of where artists exhibit, we automatically derive the measure of what we call high prestige or low prestige kind of commercial galleries, right? So there is you know, there's a Bago, you know, Gagosian, right? You know, and, uh, and galleries like this. And there are some, you know, some galleries where we show artists, but maybe the artists never enter museums and so on and so forth, right? And we look at careers of artists. Basically, in this case, big data is artist CV, right? So each exhibition, the artist's career is a data point, right? And here's what we found. So the green response to the artist, which we call low prestige, right? And the, and the pink is the artist which are high prestige, right? So low prestige means artists seldom uh, gain access to kind of high prestige institutions by the end of their careers. So maybe we never have personal shows at LACMA, right? Or, you know, are not shown at Biennales, whereas pink is artists which do. And, and what, what we found is that uh, people who start we have low, what we call low prestige places, right? Some small galleries, non-profit galleries, and so on. If we have first five shows in these places, most likely, I mean, according to their data, right? They actually don't go up, right? So out of artists who have first five shows in these low prestige places, like 72, actually, actually, actually no, actually not 72, right? I mean, uh, about 90%. Never go to the top. Only 10% people end up in the top places. This so artists immediately start their career in these high prestige places. For most of them, the career goes up. So this is very interesting, you know, because when I was going to art schools, right, and I was in Europe in the 80s and the 90s, the stereotype is that you start like in some small places, non-profit places, and so on, and then eventually you kind of make work your way up. But according to this big data on half a million artists for 30 years, it's not like this. So this is another type of research, right? Just to show you variety. Uh, in fact, there is now a whole field uh, called we have study of success, the study of academic career, artistic career. You can also look, for example, imagine that you, get, uh, you go to LinkedIn and you get CVs of all the architects on LinkedIn. Then you can also do this analysis to track, right? Where did people go to art? Where did people go? What art? What architecture school people went to? How it affected their career? What are their career paths? Uh, of course, in architecture, right, it works differently because some of you, after graduation, will try to maybe go and become intern, right, like at, at Hadid office and so on, right? Uh, so again, the architecture paths are a bit different. But that's another example of how the data, for example, about creative careers can be also used. Okay, let me now skip to something. Now, uh, uh, among this kind of big data studies, right, big, big data studies of culture, in particular, you find lots and lots of work on social media. Because social media is kind of easy to get, right? Up until a few years ago, social media platforms had so-called APIs, so the mechanism which allows you to, to download big data from platforms. Now they're mostly closed, but not all. Spotify is open, for example. So, um, so how do you find these articles? So I go to Google Scholar, right? So Google Scholar is a service from Google, uh, which uh, is a huge database of the, all the scientific articles you can find. <clears throat> in, in order to find articles which are more quantitative, where people are actually looking at the data and not simply speculating, uh, you know, I put some terms like data set and machine learning. So this is a search I did last year. I put Instagram, data set, machine learning, and I got almost 8,000 papers. Okay. So the amount of research in social media in computer scientists is massive. Like, there are probably more articles about Instagram being published one year than all papers in all humanities. Uh, now, here's another example, right? So there's lots of research about tourist behavior, right? Using uh, anonymized data from phones and so on, right? Um, so how the tourists move to different cities, where do we go? So I put tourist behavior, data set machine learning, I get 19,000 papers, okay? So it's huge. Uh, 
Now there's yet another area called aesthetic computing. So the idea of aesthetic computing, uh, you can download, right, art images or photographs from a site like Instagram. And the images have likes or favorites. And then you can say, can we can measure properties of images to try to predict why some images have more likes. So basically the idea is to study uh, uh, cultural taste and human aesthetic judgments, but study using big data. So for example, uh, I mean, I don't have examples here, but there has been also studies where people take from uh, Google Street View, hundreds of thousands of photographs of various buildings and create a website where people like rate their buildings, do we like them, we don't like them. And then people can try to create a model uh, which will kind of predict you know, what people like. So uh, here we get, again, we get 10,000 papers. Um, okay. So uh, one more theoretical slide. I know that Elena is probably wondering why I'm not talking about Instagram, but it's coming. Uh, but the point is that it's not just about Instagram, right? Uh, I feel that it's kind of my duty as somebody who spent 15 years kind of doing this research is just to give you some examples and to try to show that this is a kind of big, big paradigm. And sooner or later, you'll be working with data, maybe you're teaching or working in office or have your own practice. Sooner or later, you'll be working with data scientists. Sooner or later, you would have to learn some programming if you haven't done this. Right, it's also just as drawing, model making, writing, using Instagram, uh, I don't know, using Adobe Premiere, uh, required skills today to be like architect or you know, another creative person. Having some data literacy, it's also absolutely essential. So, um, so when I show you this example, right? Okay. So what you see is that we take data about half a million artists, you know, whole individuals who have individual circumstances, right? Who all have also content of different works, which is not, you know, which is not used here, and we aggregate it into like two groups. With based on this aggregation, we see certain patterns. Now, if you look at this study, it's the same thing, right? You take, uh, you know, hundreds and hundreds of songs. Every song is unique, right? Every song performed by a particular artist. Uh, every song is a bit different. But we reduce each song to just five characteristics, right? And then we superimpose all the songs from each summer. And then we measure, right, variability of the songs for each summer. And then we reduce each song to one point. So you see uh, that even though these are very different papers, very different studies, we're doing exactly the same thing. And this thing which we're doing is a kind of what I call meta paradigm, right? It's a way our society now thinks through data. It comes from statistics. It comes already from 18th century. You know, when you kind of measure you know, the births and the depths in a particular country, when you measure economic outputs. And this statistical thinking through data science now has expanded into practically every area of modern society. And what I mean by this thinking is that you measure something, right? you collect something, you count something, you get the data about people, you know, buildings, songs, artists, doesn't matter, and then you aggregate it. Right? So what you do, right, is your group of data into a few groups, right? Uh, like all the artists who are high prestige, low prestige, or all the songs in the summer, right? Now average into one number. And then when you group it, you start seeing some patterns. The paradox to me is this. This idea of kind of aggregating data kind of comes from 18th century, in definitely 19th century. So this method was already developed right, before people had computers, before people had big data, before people had you know, servers, Hadoops, and so on. So why do we continue using this way of thinking today when our computer can hold the data about every person in Los Angeles, about every person in Los Angeles movement throughout the day, about every building in Los Angeles, about every facade in Los Angeles. So our computer, right, can allow us to collect, store, organize, process, visualize data about billions of individual entities. 
how, so how can the intellectual take advantage of it, right? Uh, for, so for example, if you study history of architecture, right, we tell you about different types, we tell you about different styles, uh, you know, functionalism, rationalism, uh, you know, Gothic and so on. And when you go to European city, typically European city, and you find some examples of the styles, but what you also find is maybe 70 to 80% of the buildings don't belong to any particular style because they're eclectic or we can have elements of this and that, uh, but we don't have a term to describe them. And also if you start looking at buildings which are built in different styles, they all can actually maybe unique. So how can we intellectually develop ways to think about big data, use computers, right? To deal with multiplicity and variability as opposed to aggregation, right? So this is to me, right, is the biggest one of the biggest intellectual challenges of our times, and uh, it also connects to I think in some ways to the kind of future of architecture, the future of design, uh, and especially the analytical part of how you look at the city, right? So shall we continue to aggregate? Big cultural data and reduce it to patterns, frequently occurring ideas, themes, behaviors. All right, and when you do it, you can focus on what is common between number of objects. You say, okay, here, here are buildings in the rational style, here are number of buildings in postmodern style, and whatever doesn't fit, you don't talk about it. Right? Or shall we try to develop something which is almost impossible? To develop a kind of new way of thinking, which is focusing on diversity, variability, and differences, even tiny ones. Right? So, if you want to analyze the city, you include every building in the analysis, right? Statistically, you pay attention to what's infrequent. You identify kind of small cultural islands. So let's say you want to measure, right, how you people are behaving in the urban design kind of area in the neighborhood you design. So the natural thing would be to aggregate it, saying these people do this, these people do that, but then maybe there's 2,000 people which are doing all unique things. So how do you take this uniqueness into analysis? How do you question the idea of similarity? So I know this is very theoretical and kind of abstract, but that's what I see as uh, perhaps the biggest and most interesting intellectual and design challenge. Now that we have computers and we can use big data. So now um, I will show you a bit uh, kind of our work. Um, where we try to uh, use big data from Instagram and think about how we can analyze uh, the kind of diversity and variability in the richness of Instagram, because Instagram, right, when we started working on Instagram in 2012, it had 30 million users. Now it has, right, 1 billion users approximately. So you can find anything you want, right? You can find any kind of photography, I mean, you can find groups of people, right, who become friends uh, because of Instagram and travel to different locations. You can find every possible genre of self-expression. Uh, but it's kind of difficult to see it because when you go to an Instagram Explore screen, it's going to show you images which are maybe similar to what you've been looking before, but it will, in my case, it always shows the images which are very polished, right, you know, very kind of popular. So how do you even find these images which are less frequent, right, which are maybe don't respond to the rules of good photography. So let me show you some of these projects. Uh, so we'll do it online. Okay. Da, da, da. Let's see. Okay. <clears throat> so I will take you through four, about four, four projects which are all kind of different attempts to deal with, to deal with multiplicity, right, of Instagram, and not to reduce Instagram, right, to the most common, not to aggregate it into three or four or five different types of images. Oh, there are celebrities, there are influencers. Uh, no, there is girls who teach yoga, there is a Sayark students, there is cars. Yes, it all exists, but there are thousands and thousands of our topics Right? There are thousands and thousands of different visual styles. So how do we make visible Instagram without aggregating it, right? Without summarizing it, without reducing it to a small number of types? 
So it is this idea which in fact uh, was kind of driving this research. So the first project we have done in 2012-2013, it was called Photo Trails. Like it was a very first project, um, which I have done with a team of uh, uh, two students. Oh, oh, sorry. So it's not, a, okay, here it is. Oh, no, right, here it is. Yeah, so one was my undergraduate uh, kind of um, digital art student from ECSD. And one was an art history student uh, from Israel who was getting his PhD at uh, actually history of art architecture department at the uh, University of Pittsburgh. So he used his single laptop, was running it for a few months. And he downloaded 2.3 million Instagram photos from 30 different cities. And eventually, you know, we wrote a kind of we wrote an article, right, which was published in a peer-reviewed journal. And he also presented some papers in scientific conferences. But our main output was uh, visualizations. So the idea was to try to kind of experiment with different techniques to show, right, the content of Instagram. Okay. Um, so first we tried something very simple. Uh, which I call image montage. So this is simply kind of taking a bunch of images and shared on Instagram in a single city, right? So at that point, you were able to download all the, all the publicly shared images which have geolocation in a particular geographic area. So you basically send Instagram like a message saying, I want to download all the images which we shared, let's say the five by five kilometer radius around Sayar, you will get these images, right? And uh, what these visualizations kind of do, right? okay, is that, right, you will, I wrote a software 10 years ago, like I make it available as open source, it's called an image montage. So you have all the images in a directory, right, in a folder on your computer, uh, you give it parameters, it creates a big canvas, and when it starts kind of reading images from your hard drive and kind of plotting images in small size in a particular order. So the idea of this technique is to, uh, again, very, very simple, is to, use, is to use sort as an analytical method, right? So the idea is by sorting with the images in different ways, we can actually show some patterns, right? So, uh, well, we can zoom in and see what it is, right? So here are these images. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, sorry, I haven't actually used this in a while, this interface. Uh, okay, here we go. Okay. Okay. Now, uh, you can see left. So what are you doing? You actually told us that you don't want to aggregate data, but here you are aggregating data, right? You're basically putting 50,000 images in one, in one montage. So what's going on? Well, so I think here's what my answer is, right? So uh, each image is an individual, right? And uh, if you put them all together in a particular order, you start seeing patterns. So what you're seeing here, let me just check, make sure which city it is. I'm showing you just a moment. Ah, oh, yeah, yeah. So this is Tokyo. So this is 50,000 images from Tokyo, from, from, you know, from a center of Tokyo, if, like, I mean, one of the Tokyo centers, right? Tokyo, like LA, doesn't have one center, right? Five by five kilometers. Shared over the course of a few days. And, uh, we, right, so the software places the images by time. So every time a new image sorted, it's, it's basically placed here. So it goes top to bottom, left to right. And uh, what you see when you zoom out is a part, you basically, get a particular pattern right, uh, of like a city going through its routines. So the dark parts correspond to nights, right? So people go to sleep. Uh, so there are more dark images, but you know, Instagram nights are not completely dark because people share images over parties, people share images over vacations. People, I don't know, maybe want to share images you design. So the nights on Instagram are not completely dark, they a bit dark. This is daytime and uh, you, what you can see is every day, right? Every day, every night is different. So one day people share more images, one day people share less images. You know, and even though there are lots of similarities, there's also lots of small differences. 
So my way of addressing this challenge, right? How do you combine this technique, right? This way of thinking, which we'll use in our normal life. So generalize from our experience, right? To aggregate the data, so you can see general patterns. And at the same time, right? Thinking about the diversity and variability of data was to basically come up with this technique, right? Because the typical thing would be to basically to measure this, when you get like a sine wave, for example, right? Which would correspond to brightness over time. Or you can measure, you know, something else over time and you basically present it as a graph. So instead of doing it, right? I'm representing each image as an image. So what you can do, you can zoom in and you can actually see, right? This diversity and variability of human behaviors. And what's interesting, right? People, of course, people, right? People, you know, this is not 1984 yet. Although sometimes I feel that our, some of our countries are going in this direction, right? But it's not 1984 yet. So, you know, people are kind of free, right? To do what you want, right? So you can leave Sayark, you can go have sushi, and you can go have Mexican, you can go home, right? You, you, you don't have to leave Sayark. So everybody kind of has free will, right? Everybody is doing what you want. But there are certain collective patterns, right? So in a certain time, with the rush hour in LA will be stronger, right? Because people go to work, let's say 8.30 to 9 a.m., right? And maybe after 9 p.m., the traffic, right, will be less. So this is uh, what, uh, what Emil Durkheim, the founder of sociology, has called social facts. Right? So Durkheim was the first thinker who started to use statistics at the end of the 19th century, and he came, out, he came up with sociology what he basically said what you see from the data is that even though everybody has a free will, right, there are certain you know, social patterns of commonality. And one way Durkheim kind of was arguing for this, he published a very famous book in uh, 1897, which is a foundational book in sociology called Suicide. So he got the data on suicide rates in different European countries. And what he saw is that he said suicide, right, I mean, it's extremely. Well, it's a very individual act, right? I mean, you make decision to take suicide or not, right? So there is nothing that's systematic about it, but what you found is the rates of suicide in different countries in Europe are very consistent from year to year. He said, this is a proof that there are the social facts. So every, even though every individual is kind of free to do what they want, together their behavior uh, amounts to certain common patterns. Sorry to bring this set topic, but you know, this is what it's a basically book which is more important than Marx's capital. So it's important to kind of mention it. So what you see here is that people are free to do what they want. And you can see this diversity and variability is photographs, but when you zoom out, you start seeing this collective pattern. But what I like about this kind of visualization is that I think in some ways it shows both diversity and variability, but it also shows the presence of this kind of social facts the visual facts or behavioral facts. Um, so this is one way we have done it, just to kind of, just to sort it over time. So here, for example, uh, you have uh, the same thing from Tel Aviv, right? So here we're looking at 50,000 images, which we shared in Tel Aviv, Israel, for particular days. If these days happen to be like very important uh, national kind of celebrations, like the day of remembrance, you know, the day of independence. And what you see again is every day and every night are very, very similar. And sure something happens, right? Because at five o'clock, we stop work and there are sirens and people can go on the streets. And you can see kind of right how this event gets registered, right? In the kind of changing pattern with Instagram images. Okay. So you can see how exceptional can manifest itself on a communication platform such as Instagram. Let's see. Now, uh, in our way, we try to visualize these images is using the technique which I call radial image plot. Uh, so here, the idea is to plot all the images in two dimensions. Uh, so one axis is how far the image is to the center. Right? And the second axis is the angle. Uh, and again, you can sort in different ways. Um, so to, if you want to sort images by visual properties, you use techniques from a field called computer vision, right? So you can measure saturation, hue, brightness, uh, number of shapes, type of shapes, line orientations, presence of faces, uh, presence of different objects, right? You can all measure it from images. 
this is part of computer vision with skilled has been around since late 50s and only in the last few years i think it becomes more visible to kind of cultural creators uh, there are many many projects using computer vision so what we have done when you know again i wrote very simple software which you can download and use it can measure a few basic properties of every every image so again it's very simple right you know that every pixel is a grayscale value between 0 and 255 if you're using 8-bit representation so the computer simply reads this pixel value from image file and calculate for average, right? So if the image is kind of perfect gray, it will be 128. If it's black, it's going to be zero and so on. So in this case, we measured average hue. And it turns, it turns out that it's a kind of, it's a kind of, right? It's a meaningful measurement. I was very suspicious at first. What's the average hue, right? So, the image, so it's basically 50,000 images uh, from, again, let me see. I see. Okay, so we can't go back to the same image, okay. 50,000 images also from Tel Aviv, the same ones I showed you before. And we organize in two ways, right? So we organize by time, the time we were shared. So the time goes, uh, 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 it's an angle, so it goes radially. Each of the slices corresponds to one day. And then uh, the position of each image uh, in relation to the center, is determined by hue. So here you have the red images, right? Here you have like uh, blue, uh, yellow, and so on. And again, what you find is that every day, right? Every day is kind of similar, but of course a bit unique, right? So you see this interplay between similarity and differences. And here's when this uh, special event kind of go, you know, right? Special event takes place. So, you know, the, the company stop work at five o'clock, people we'll go outside, but, you know, there are fireworks. And, and this event is registered, right, on Instagram. But I think what's interesting is that it's not registered as some dramatic change. It's simply like registered as a kind of almost like a small change, right? So what you get on Instagram is not kind of perfect. It's not a perfect representation of what happens in the physical space. Because people also share images of you know, cats and dogs and vacations. But almost like you have this kind of signal, right? You have a signal. Right? which is the pattern you get for every day. And here you have a different signal which is superimposed. Or you can think about it differently. You can say, well, this kind of typical pattern you get every day, it's a kind of noise, right? It's a background. It's a background. And this is a figure. It's a figure, right? It's a different object which appears over this background. Uh, so let me see what else is here. Okay, so that was, um, kind of, right? that was kind of one uh, first project we have done. Elena, I know it we're like about 15 minutes in, um, so I, I will, you know, I will try to go through quickly so we have time for discussion. Um, so we have these visual signatures, right? The, the images of cities rendered in the same way: New York, San Francisco, Tokyo, and Bangkok, uh, and so on and so forth. Okay. Now I want to show you this one because that's another important, I think, visualization we have done, which shows you a different way, in which you have dramatic event gets uh, registered, right? Gets visualized on Instagram. So maybe, I know you guys know the West Coast, so New York can be like on a different planet. But maybe some of you heard about Hurricane Sandy. Right? So Hurricane Sandy was, I think, uh, 2012 in New York, right? A very big event, a big hurricane. Uh, so uh, so my, you know, my, my collaborator, right, a PhD student, Nadav Hochman, um, he downloaded right all the images from Instagram, from uh, New York, uh, for 24 hours, and he visualized them, right? And again, we're kind of simply sorted by hue. So here you can see like right normal day, people sharing images, people sharing images. Even here something happens. So this is the moment at uh, around 10 p.m. in the evening when Con Edison. Like electric station in New Jersey went out, right? It kind of blown blown out, and suddenly, like all, like parts of New York lost electricity. <laughs> you can see how this kind of gets reflected here. But again, I think what's interesting, right? It gets reflected, but not as an absolute break. It's not that there are no images, but suddenly, kind of people start sharing much less because maybe you know, maybe we kind of do our things, and also suddenly people are not taking pictures from outside anymore, right? So there are no more dark images because New York becomes completely dark, okay? So this is one project. Um, so then uh, we have done 
Let's look at this one. Yeah. So then we can um, let's look at this one, right? Yeah. Let's look at Sophie City. Um, so Sophie City um, was a kind of different attempt to look at Instagram. So here we decided not to uh, focus on a particular geographic area and collect everything, but we decided to focus on a particular kind of genre of selfies. Which is now completely trivial and taken for granted. But in 2013, it was a new thing. In fact, in November 2013, I think it was like one of the most prestigious dictionaries have entered, had said, self is a, you know, is a, is a, is a world of a year. So the self phenomenon was really exploding. So we wanted to see how we can visualize the kind of patterns across selfies in different cities. And again, the idea is to both show you different patterns which you get by aggregating data but also show you images themselves so you can see the kind of diversity and variability of individual faces individual photographs um, so we created different visualizations but let me just immediately go to the key part of a project called self-exploratory so here uh, we try to create uh, an interactive interface which will allow you to explore the selfies using um, various parameters we have measured from every selfie photo using computer vision, right? So we now computer vision services, which cost something, but usually you can, you can use them to analyze a few thousand images for free to try them out with like 20, 20 plus services. So you can, for example, measure properties of each face, uh, you know, like even emotions we, we manifested in your facial expressions, do I have glasses? Do I have a smile? How strong is the smile? And because it's done by computer, if I ask Elena, Elena, here's 100 photographs. Can you like, describe how much each photograph is smiling on a scale of 1 to 100? It becomes difficult, right? 1 to 10. But the computer can do it. So one of the advantages of using a computer as a tool for describing and analyzing reality, including architecture, is that computer can actually measure things much more precisely than you can do. Right, so this ability to measure, for example, body movements, right? For example, you want to see how people walk in LA. Like, what's the speed at which people are walking in different parts of an LA? Well, if you, you can eyeball it, you can say this is faster, but slower. You know, but it will be very hard for you to, to, com to compare quantitatively how the speed at which people walk in a hundred different areas. But the computer can do it, right? So this ability to measure things very precisely becomes very important if you want to think on a global scale for example, if you want to compare the patterns of how people walk, how their body moves in a thousand different cities, it becomes easy to do it with computer. So um, I'm very proud. So I work with like, a team of designers, including one of the most like, well-known visualization designer in this whole field, Moritz Stefaner from Germany. And I'm very proud that this project in 2014 was awarded kind of golden Nika at the kind of, with Oscars for data visualization, which take place every year. It's called Data is Beautiful competition. So this website was chosen as the best visualization website of the year. Okay? Uh, and of course, you know, uh, you know I mean, 90% of it goes to designers, but I also obviously played the part as a project leader. Um, so let's take a look. Okay. <clears throat> So, uh, you know, we couldn't show, like, uh, so we basically collected, right, um, all, the, all the publicly shared Instagrams uh, with geolocation in the central regions in six different cities. Uh, so, Sao Paulo, New York, sorry, there is no LA. We got one city from each continent, uh, London, Berlin, Moscow, and, and Bangkok, and later we added London. And then, uh, Using kind of mechanical Turk, which is you know probably no service on Amazon, which a lot, which kind of where you can hire people to describe your images to do our tasks, and also computer vision, we identified selfies, so what we think are selfies, and eventually we got data set where we had 640 selfies for every city. So we couldn't figure out, we couldn't really show uh, interactively all the selfies, so we only show you like like. A selection, right? Some of them. Let's just make it smaller, right? So if you want to see all of them, right? You click here. And what you can see is that if you give like human, right, viability 
if human looks at lots and lots of images, if these images are not sorted in any way, it becomes impossible for you to see patterns, right? For example, how many people are smiling? How many people are uh, turning their kind of head to the right? It's impossible to see, right? You are, your, your, your brain is not able to extract these patterns. So in order for us to extract patterns uh, and to see, like to compare, you know, the kind of poses, face expression, and so on, in different cities, we have to measure it, and then we're going to basically uh, look at these measurements. So the way it works is you have this interface panel on the top. Uh, so here you can kind of filter the data set using different measurements, and then whatever uh, self is, uh, will fit your selections will be shown here. So first of all, we can select by city. For example, here is Bangkok, right? Uh, here is Moscow. Here is New York. Okay. Okay. And then uh, I can also select, for example, by age. So let's, we can, for example, select all the people on Instagram who are like, really old, Instagram old, like 30 plus, right? And we can see what there are exactly 350 of the selfies. And you immediately already start seeing some patterns, right? Maybe these people don't smile as much. Some of them look a bit grumpy, not so happy, in fact, right? Uh, and you can, all, you can combine the selections. For example, we can say here's all the people from, um, from New York who are also like 30 years plus and who also, uh, according to Instagram, I mean, according to computer vision, look what computer vision system thinks are happy, right? Okay. Now, at this point, we don't know if we're actually happy or we're just smiling, obviously, for Instagram. I mean, obviously, right, it's really difficult for a computer to identify kind of like, for example, irony and whether you're pretending or not. So this is simply looking at the expression. Right? And then uh, what I can do is I can basically uh, say share. And now I get the string. And what I can do, I can send the string. You can enter it in your browser. And you're actually going to get this interface with exactly the same selection that also allows us to communicate the results. Uh, and here's what I want to say, right? So when we uh, did this project in 2014, I was extremely excited because I thought, well, so here we have this interactive interface, which in theory can be used to explore any image collections and compare images in different parameters. And it allows us, right, to see certain patterns in selfies. So for example, uh, if you say, let's select Bangkok, Right, so here's our whole data set for Bangkok. And here we're going to um, select kind of people who are tilting their head to the right. Okay. And here are exactly these people, right? And maybe from these people, we're going to select the people who uh, computer vision system things are looking angry. Okay, again, right, we're not angry, but you know, Maybe computer vision thinks we're angry because we're turning very head, but we don't look very happy. So, so I was very, very excited. And I still think it's very amazing. It's also amazing the project still runs after like six years. But here's what I realized later on. So in fact, what this interface reveals are not only patterns and similarity, but it also reveals how every person, right? Every face, every photograph is different, right? So when you start, aggregating data, right? So here we're aggregating data by different categories, by different measurements. So we select, you know, again, all people, let's say in Moscow, and we select, for example, all people who like between ages of 18.6 and 21.2, right? And we select people who all like tilted their head to the left, and uh, actually lots of them. And now maybe we select people who computer vision things are more calm as opposed to not calm, right? What you get is a kind of category, right? So we just create, we just constructed this category ad hoc, right? So it's a category of people who are like from Moscow, have particular age, are tilting their head to the, right, to, the, you know, to the left and have particular mood. But in reality, we can put different people, they can put different photographs. And each photograph creates a different impression, different mood, different feeling. And I think this is kind of my, 
for me, it was my major insight in the last few years. So after I spent 10 years or 12 years working with big data, learning data science, and learning statistics, and kind of figuring out that you can collect large cultural data sets, when you can aggregate them by different categories or by different measurements, if you can compare patterns in these categories, at the end, it only shows you how, in fact, individual, unique, each member of category, right? So while you can, for example, you know, go for, I don't know, downtown LA or downtown or, you know, or Prague or Dresden, you can, you can photograph every building and you can measure different kind of characteristics of every building and you can look at some statistics, right? You can visualize them. You know, most buildings will be a bit different, different balcony, a different door color. So this, as I said, to me is the biggest challenge in thinking about culture, society, urbanism, in terms of big data, using big data for research, while we can aggregate data to seek of larger patterns, right? Every time we do it, we also lose something, right? We no longer see the differences between images in the category because now we fold as members of one category. Uh, so let me just take three minutes, three minutes to show you on Broadway and then hopefully we'll have some time for discussion. Okay, no, okay, so that's So that was the third project I've done. I mean, in total, I did about six or seven projects on Instagram, but that's a project I've done with the same team, same designers. This project also got the award next year, not with gold, but with silver, so second best. Um, so that's what happens when you work with like a very powerful collaborator, right? Uh, and um, so what we've done, is, what we've done here, is we were inspired by this project, which maybe some of you know, because it's one of the most famous art projects about LA by Ed, uh, Edward Ruscher, LA artist. In 1966, he put uh, a camera on his car and he drove along a few miles of Sunset Boulevard. He like photographed every building. Even he put it together in this kind of book, which sometimes you can see in exhibitions, it's like eight meters long. So today it reminds a lot of Google Street View, right? but it was an art project from 1966. So the idea is how you can present the city, right, through its images, uh, and today through its data. So we decided to look at New York, and we decided not to make a two-dimensional map of New York, but to take a kind of different look, to basically use the same procedure he used, which is to slice New York along a single street. <clears throat> so if Ed Russia chose Sunset, Sunset Boulevard, which is a kind of, right, very iconic street in LA, we chose Broadway, the longest street in LA. It used to be Indian Trail. It's uh, 20, 21, 22 kilometers long. And we decided to collect all the data along with Broadway. But of course, Broadway is a line. So how do we collect the data along the line? So we define this kind of corridor, like 100 meters around Broadway, right? It's like spine. And we try to collect all kinds of uh, social media and urban and social data about this corridor who can represent the diversity and changes and inequality in New York for what happens along this Broadway corridor. Uh, so, we, so we've done lots of experiments, lots of tests. Um, so this is one, right, a very scientific view of our data. So the x-axis is the, is the kind of Broadway, right? So normally Broadway goes, right, vertically, so we can turn it, right, 90 degrees. So here you have Wall Street, uh, NYU, Times Square, Columbia University, Harlem, and so on. And these are different data sources which we used. Um, so Instagram, Foursquare, Twitter, uh, taxi, taxi rides. Uh, so it was 2012 before, before Uber. So we got data on all the taxi rides in Manhattan for one year. 511 million taxi rides. Um, and uh, two different colors show you when somebody got into the taxi, the location and when somebody got out, of course, only, only when somebody kind of, right, I mean, no personal data, it was all anonymized, but we got it from a city office. And then uh, the volume of these graphs corresponds to how much people share, right? So here, how much people were sharing Instagram, every particular part along Broadway, Foursquare, and Twitter. And you can see what basically New York really exemplifies. Now it's very visible, right, uh, during coronavirus days, uh, but it's, it's kind of visible always. 
it wasn't maybe as visible in 2013 when we were working with project. So this project does make it more visible. New York is basically with no New York, right? With no lace. But are different countries. Right? There is the downtown, there is Hollywood and Santa Monica, and then there is East LA. It's different countries, right? That's America, right? There's no there is no there's no America, right? There's 50 states. And there are no American cities. Most cities have right very poor people, and maybe with some dangerous, dangerous areas. In the immigrant areas, and then like more white, you know, middle, more like middle class and rich areas, and we're completely disconnected, right? And in LA, you can live in LA your whole life and just not think about it because you don't have to drive to East LA, right? In New York, every time you go on the street, you see it, right? You can see homeless everywhere. You see homeless on Fifth Avenue. So what you see, right, all these indicators, social sharing, income, right, taxi rights, there is much more of it. And then uh, at the end of Central Park, around 100 streets, it just dies, right? So even though these areas where are more professionals living right now, at least you don't really see it. And you can say, well, why nobody sharing anything in this more, let's say, less affluent areas where people don't use social media? No, we use social media a lot, but they go to work. So during the day, right, most people go to work in Midtown. And people from Queens and Broadway go to work in New York. So the population of New York is of Manhattan is one sorry, 1.7 million, but every day 2.3 million come from other areas. So that's why if you can kind of plot the data like this, all right, uh, with the fact that people go to work and they share the data, you know, during their work hours gets aggregated, and also that's where tourists are. So that's where the differences between the less affluent part and more affluent part gets magnified. So we said, okay, that's wonderful, but we kind of want to create a unique interface which wouldn't have any graphs, which is more intuitive. Um, so um, what we have done is this interactive interface designed for touch screens. It was a commission from New York Public Library. Late was also shown at the Shanghai Architecture Biennials and different places. And I'll just play a video which shows you kind of how you interact with interface. And uh, it was installed in New York Public Library for 30 months. And what I really liked about it is that you would see like some very old New Yorkers, some old ladies, right, who you wouldn't even think know how to use, right, phone, but New Yorkers, they're very smart, we do. So we would go and we start using the interface, oh, say, so it's the house where I live. What's the place I went to school? So the idea was to create a kind of map of a city, which you wouldn't have any map, right? What's the best way to create a map of LA? Don't make a map, make something else, right? Don't use what everybody else is doing and kind of foreground with data, but data as images, as opposed to data as data points. And then that's a lot you now show, then we can have discussion, I hope. Okay, so this is just the images are loading, the spell on Broadway, right? So here, what you have here is, uh, you kind of have this, like, you know, like Napoleon cake, right? So this is a Broadway, right? So the geography goes um, horizontally, again, uh, from uh, south to north, so Wall Street, uh, Washington Square, uh, and so on. And each data source is shown in its own layer, but they're shown as images. So if you have Instagram images which are shared in each area, in, in each area uh, sorted by hue. Uh, here you have images from Google Street View. So one of the sources of Google Street View, right? So you can download these images. So this is looking uh, left to right, and this is looking up. Even this. This kind, of, this kind of layers represent this data. I mean, how many Facebook messages people share, how many tweets, what's the income, but uh, represented, right, is this kind of colorful bars. And what you can do is you can zoom in and zoom out. So when you zoom out, you go like this, you see the whole city on one screen. And when you zoom in, you start navigating the city like 30 meters at a time, because 30 meters is the interval in Google Street View car Takes images of LA. Mm -hmm. So when you zoom out, right, you start seeing with numbers in the center, which says this is how many taxes people take in this area per day, how many Facebook messages. So the statistics get updated to show you the statistics for a particular part of the city. And when you zoom out, now the statistics show you patterns, right, for the whole city. So in this Project I think we I think we were successful, but you can tell me, uh, is that you know we able we able to use this amazing ability of computer, which is very fundamental, 
to zoom in on information, zoom in on data, something you can, for example, you can zoom in right on your Word document. You can also zoom in using Google, using Google Maps or Google Earth. So you should be able to zoom in into the city and zoom out. And uh, again, that's a kind of I think different way in which this project tries to combine representing patterns and representing individual buildings, individual uh, sort of parts uh, by being right, by able to zoom into the data and show you with facades and also show Instagram people sharing the particular area. Uh, so not all right, not only kind of representing data as graphs and summarizing it, but actually showing you the city in its kind of diversity. Of course, ideally I would like to have it for like screen which is 100 meters long, and ideally I would like to include billions of images. So we're also limited, so we only include about 60,000 Instagrams. Uh, this was done in 2014. And also the screens are expensive, so the screen costs a few thousand dollars. So we didn't want to have an expensive setup. So the project, you know, because the project was shown like in eight different places as opposed to one place. So that's for it. Um, as always, I took a bit uh, too much time. But, you know, I love you guys so much. Uh, when Elena invited me and finally realized I can do it, uh, I was like so happy because I can't think of a better audience for my work than Sire students. And I do hope, I mean, sorry I took a bit longer, but I have so much to tell you and to inspire you, I hope. Uh, and I hope we'll have some time for discussion. Yes, I would like to open the microphone to all the students that oh, might have questions. Let me just, yeah, yeah. yeah. And maybe while they think about the questions, I know you are not, I mean, I don't know if Instagram is still something you work on. I was wondering, what is the impact of the pandemic on Instagram? Are they, yeah. are we well, posting yeah, so, more or less inside sure. the door? Yeah, so what happened is this, right? So between 2008 and 2018, uh, all the kind of like, major, all the most popular social networks, had a mechanism which allows basically anybody to download their images and data. So it was called API. And then because of a, you know, the Brexit scandal, right? You know, the Cambridge Analytica scandal, uh, was this kind of pressure. And they basically, basically disabled this API. So you can't really officially download data from Instagram or Facebook, uh, but you, you can still download data from Spotify. You can download data from Behance. So now we kind of now I'm doing a big project called Elsewhere, which is basically looking at the development of global professional culture in the last 20 years worldwide. And for example, we downloaded data on 1.5 million projects from Behance. So that's why I can't really answer your question, right? Because basically after 2016, people are still publishing papers, but it's the data which we collected before 2016. Um, so. Right, so I don't know what's going on, uh, but uh, you know, there are articles in media, right, which talk about all oh, influencers, everybody tired of influencers, influence, but Instagram is not just influencers, right? 99.99% of Instagram is basically casual photographers, people going and photographing their birthdays and their burgers, right? And you know, and uh, you and your girlfriend, I know, go to Santa Monica, right, for example. So it's a basically really a representation of everyday life. And that's what I found when I started looking at Instagram because I didn't show you all. I also wrote a whole book about Instagram, right? Which is available online where I talk about it. Uh, but um, so what I've done is I switched to different platforms where you can download the data, which are more kind of professional platforms like Behance. And we're also using uh, four, four and a half million uh, records about events on Meetup. So as you know, the students are actually, some of them are definitely using Instagram to um, broadcast their work. And even as uh, a class graduate thesis, we have an Instagram account that becomes a way to interact um, with all of us. Um, anyway, I want to open the, you know, the door to the questions here to all the students, if there is anything that um, any of you would like to ask um, Lev. I'm just taking, just, I never shared, I'm just taking screenshots. I hear. <laughs> yeah, just, just, just from my archive, you know, just, just to have archive, because in this month I'm giving like eight different lectures on Zoom, all for different countries, including China and uh, Israel, so it's just fascinating. Yes, you guys, you know, you know what's interesting, like sometimes you give a lecture, everybody has virtual background, and virtual background just shows somebody's room, 
you guys are like more sophisticated. So you actually realize we don't need to use virtual background. So it's interesting yeah? also. Anyway, so questions. You guys are so shy. I know. This is not in China, in, China, like in, in Asian countries, right? Students are afraid to ask questions. Not afraid, mental, you know, you can't ask questions. It's impolite, right? But usually like in, in LA, you know, in America, people are very aggressive sometimes, you know, so they're very active. So it's amazing. Please. Um, can I ask a question here? Yes, yes please. I, is it, can you yes. hear me? Yeah, I hear you. Okay, okay. Hi, Alev. Um, thank you for this uh, lecture. I actually want to ask about the, when in the beginning you mentioned about the, 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 ana the data analysis on the, how careers evolve for artists according to their, their prestige. How did you consider that, like, how was prestige considered for you? Like, what will right, be the right. Right, okay, so first of all, just to make clear, this is not my work, right? Oh, okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, 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 I'm not, sm I'm not a smart. So the first two projects I showed, mm -hmm. one was done by uh, kind of, uh, you know, basically people at New York Times about music. Mm -hmm. Just to show you that you can also find these projects today, like in, in popular media. And mm -hmm. The second was done uh, by, my network, by in the lab of a scientist called uh, Barabashi. Uh, I, can, uh, I can send a... Uh, you know, uh, at the end of a chat, I can just kind of post his papers online. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's, yeah. it's, it's like a top network. <laughs> yeah, he's like a top network scientist, right? Mm -hmm. That would like, be wonderful. In, a, Thank in you. A north, <laughs> northeastern. So you can kind of read mm -hmm. exactly. And paper is very short, right? Because the paper in science mm -hmm. and nature, it basically makes a whole career. Papers are just three pages. It takes about three years usually to write one paper like this. Uh, so you can see exactly uh -huh. how we did it. Uh, mm -hmm. So to be honest, I don't remember. But what I remember is this. Like, mm -hmm. we haven't used some external criteria to say it's prestigious or not. I think we kind of basically represented, right, all the people as we kind of move for exhibitions, right, going for the galleries and museums as a network. Oh, okay. And uh, I, think, I think maybe, okay, I may be wrong, but I think maybe like a node, maybe a node, right, to which most other nodes connect is more prestigious. So, for example, mm. so maybe like MoMA, or is more prestigious when I know Whitney Museum, et cetera, something like this, right? Uh, so, so in other words, the idea was that what's interesting is we derived it exactly from the data, like from, you know, from this network representation of the data, not externally, you know? Oh, uh, but uh, the problem is that, yeah, we're data. So that's what's interesting. I mean, it's very interesting, but we look at the paper. Um, sorry, I should have looked it up. Mm -hmm. um, but um, I will, I will kind of, uh, you know, I will, I will also send the link to the paper to Elena so you can share it. Thank you, I'll, I'll share it, okay. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, Liv. Hi. Um, uh, having so, I I have been a data scientist for a couple of years before entering architecture. Um, and I'm sorry, curious. sorry, it was all obvious to you. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> no. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah. And I'm curious as to so usually uh, to predict say for example customer behavior future customer behavior or performance of of a of a particular product in the next six months or say in the next six years uh in the next six years or even um we used a, a sort of predictive modeling right. based and studied and created patterns and we studied past customer history or past product history in, sure. in order to be able to predict how it would perform in the future, um, but with your uh, with your project with uh, self explanatory, self exploratory, yeah. um, I I'm curious if um, like the the characteristics that you've chosen, the parameters that you've chosen, like mood or um, uh, or orientation, right. or smile, or eyes open and close, the parameters that you've chosen, would they help predict a sort of future behavior of people in a particular city? Or in, in other words, would it help, or is there a way yeah. to predict a cultural or emotional zeitgeist? Yeah, so it's a very interesting question, yeah. So first of all, since you're data scientist, I think you realized that um, our study, right? Our study was not about kind of predictive analytics and actually not really data analysis. Our study was really what's called exploratory data analysis, right? In data science. But what I realized 15 years ago is that this method of exploratory data analysis, like bar graphs and pie charts, 
and, and descriptive statistics. We work very well for all kinds of data, but when you start using them for culture, you, know, you don't longer see the objects of themselves. So I wanted to create methods for what I call exploratory media analysis, right? Uh, right. So this visualization is like, yeah, it's not perfect by any means, in what I, I would be fun, but it's a my own attempt. So basically, say, how to explore image collection, maybe about which you don't know anything. Uh, so mm -hmm. it's a combination of measurements and also visualizations, which by sorting images, allow you to see patterns. So it's the idea to augment your intellect, not to completely mm -hmm. replace you by AI. Now, uh, so we, interesting question you say, right? So we capture <laughs> some data about people's behavior or let's say people images on social media. Uh, can we use it to predict something? Well, so of course I don't know, right? So the first step would be to go to Google, Google Scholar and see if you can find something. Uh, I mean, obviously a single Instagram image, right? It's a very kind of, right? It's a very poor data point. Uh, mm -hmm. But one thing which was really interesting to me, and I have actually downloaded this data, but just, you know, I'm just one person, right? And, you know, I have to lecture to Elena and travel, right? So I can understand the world and write books. Yeah, so I had a few people in my lab, but I'm not like a science lab. I don't have like 30 people writing 30 papers, right? So mm -hmm. I have some, so, you know, if any of you want to use any of my data set, please, guys, please do it. Uh, mm -hmm. Because I, I'm sitting on all this amazing data, because now you can't get this data anymore. Well, anyway, so what I've done is I downloaded, I mean, you can also do it today, right? You can go download, let's say, last 100 photographs, last 500 photographs from two individual accounts. And then you can get sequence, right? You can get sequence of what we post. Right. And then, of course, you can probably predict something, right? Uh, I've never seen papers like this, but that would be interesting exercise. Uh, one more thing I mentioned. So, um, so there is like a huge amount of research at the intersection of computer science, data science, and with what I call social cultural data. And mm -hmm. one body of research, uh, I mean, one, one kind of paradigm, one of like millions of paradigms in this field, is the idea to use kind of social networks to see uh, if you can predict Kind of people psychological behavioral you know, characteristics from their friends so maybe you heard right there was a very visible work actually done by my former colleague at UCSD James Fowler so what you found is that if I go to Facebook right and I can look at who you connected to and you know you can kind of basically you can read you can basically read like your post you can read the post you can put your post in software and, and the software will actually very accurately predict your psychological profile so people who like have more like happy friends, I also like usually happy, right? So the idea mm -hmm. is that like, right, more happy people choose more happy people. Uh, and also if you look at, for example, how smoking spreads. So the idea is that, you know, uh, you get influenced by kind of people who are, who are in your network, right? So mm -hmm. that's one way in which, you know, it's been done. But I don't know if anybody has done, for example, for like city or behavior inside buildings, uh, or maybe even like how they photograph a city or services. Amazing, amazing work which can be done, right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. So maybe you should do it. I mean, you know, right? Okay. You know, because I think I think right, I think the, I think I think architects I can, haven't really discovered data science yet. Yes, mm -hmm. I mean I know that people learn how to program in my right using mail. That was very popular ten years ago, as Elena knows, right? Uh, but uh, uh, yeah, so people use a lot like programming for generation, form generation, right? You know, uh, obviously, you know. Patrick, right? Patrick and parametric design. Uh, but this data analysis and data prediction is, I think, I think it's maybe can be, it would be still like maybe next paradigm. So that's why I wanted to spend part of my lecture kind of inspiring you guys to just, just to think about it, yeah. And to learn about this work. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Good, very good question, yeah. Um, Lev, I have actually another question. It's more like related to the thesis that I'm making that it, Actually, I read your article that mentions the aesthetics of K-pop in the in the Instagram. And as a as a huge fan of K-pop, as you see also in my virtual background, I I was analyzing a bit between as a fan um, from 2015 to 2020, just like for mm -hmm. curiosity. And I want to know. I would like to ask your opinion because from what I saw in your research, you use like Red Velvet or Two Any One, which were videos from like 2014 or 2013, and even yeah. NCT. Um, have you checked by any chance if there is like any difference between this time, that that time, and and now? Oh God, 
you guys making me you make me happy, but I'm happy because you know <laughs> I, no because I want I want like I want to have a team of like I want to have a team of like you know twenty five students and just to put you guys no because you know to me I'm you know Elena knows I'm a very curious person. You know, I had sabbatical last year. Sabbatical when you don't teach, right? So you can do whatever you want. I traveled for three hundred and forty days. I I I stayed in twenty seven different cities in eighteen countries. Just to see the world, right? So, you know, so the reason I do this research, I'm curious, right? I'm curious, what do people do, right? In, uh, in, in some city, I know, in uh, Costa Rica, right? I, I'll never go over, right? Uh, of course, we do realize with Instagram, Facebook, and so on, it's not a like reality, right? It's a particular version of reality, and it's very, right? So people don't smile as much, but still, right? Lots of reality kind of breaks through. Well, so here's the thing, right? So one of the things which really interests me a lot is a kind of cultural change. So that's why the first project I showed you is about music changes, right? Yes. And the second project, it's also about kind of changes, right? So, so the ability to look at change over time and not to think about history in terms of periods. Okay, we have, eclect we have like eclecticism, historicism, you know, I don't know, Le Corbusier, no? but in terms of gradual changes, right? That to me is one of the most amazing things you can do. And of course, that's how scientists look at, right? History of the universe, the history of Earth. Or like, or like, for example, development of a baby. But now if you can measure some things culturally, we can also look at how things change. For example, how do styles on Instagram change, right? How do influencers statistics change? So I have um, some data sets, but my data sets, you know, they're very, very partial, right? So I have something from New York in 2012, and when I have something from London in 2015. So I haven't really tried to kind of compare them, uh, except uh, I did try to do one thing. So one thing I was curious, right? How does the effect of kind of using also software like Instagram app, right? And also evolution, I mean, how the evolution of interfaces, right? So at some point, Instagram had 10 filters, when it had 20 filters, when people started using Visco, right? Uh, and, you know, uh, uh, et cetera. How does this change kind of visual culture, right? Uh, well, I mean, if you want to do it for fashion, maybe you get hold of, thousands of photographs of like street fashion and compare. But street mm -hmm. fashion is also a very particular genre of photography, right? So yes. what I tried to do is we took, we took like, so we had, um, we also did a project where Twitter gave us 270 million image tweets, right? <laughs> it basically gave us all, it basically gave us all the, I got a grant, I, I win a grant, I won a grant from them. They said, what do you want? I said, I want everything. We said, okay, sure, what, what is everything? I, said, I want you to give me all the images which you shared on Twitter up until that moment. We said, we don't know how many, we, we don't have time to look at this, right? You know, people think of companies as this kind of evils. No, we're just sitting there like trying to just make sure the thing is working, right? So, uh, so that was 2014. Uh, so Twitter introduced image function in uh, 2011, uh, but we, we didn't ask for all images, we only asked for images which had like um, geo tag. And at that time, the way Twitter was working, very few images had geo tag, so all we got was 270 million which of course I never look at them because too much. So what I was curious, I said, are there some changes in like color, saturation, kind of brightness? Are there some very basic visual changes? So we took selection of images from 2012 and 2014, you know, and we kind of measured them and we saw some changes. Mm -hmm. But we look at these images in terms of 100 different cities. So we took selection, like 30 million images, and, and every city we changed was different. Yes. <clears throat> so in reality, I, so I didn't publish it because I, I don't know what to publish, right? Uh, so, so, so that's the thing, right? And you know, that goes back to when you look at like, you know, Instagram or if you look at Behance, right? You have, you know, thousands and millions of different people were in cities and genres and everyone can have a different pattern. So I can aggregate it. So maybe if I aggregate it, I say, well, actually across with 100 cities, images became like a bit brighter but actually every city was a bit different, right? Uh, but uh, in terms of today, um, well, I mean, I can tell you one thing, right? So I think, uh, so basically up to 2013, Instagram was Instagram. And in 2013, it was bought by Facebook. And, you know, and we very gradually started to monetize it, right? So yeah. in 2015, Instagram basically was like, was like, like, was like, like basically art for art's sake. Well, images were square, right? It was like very, very kind of conceptual medium. And then added stories, advertising, et cetera, et cetera. So I think that obviously uh, the proportion of businesses and companies and freelancers, which is Instagram has increased. 
but so is the number of users, right? So 2013, it was 30 million people. Now it's 100 billion people. So my feeling, if I was if I was able, but I can't, to go and make and take a really big sample of Instagram, you, what you may find is proportion of its commercial accounts is maybe less than 2013 because you actually have 100 billion people. But the thing is, you know, what is visible and what media writes about is influencers and how does you know, Zara and how does Prada use Instagram, right? So it basically writes about these more exceptional cases. Um, so, um, so, so, so I don't know, but, but I appreciate your question. Maybe I will try to do it. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, yeah. I yeah. Yeah, please. Yeah. Hi, Lev, thanks for the lecture. In your work, much of it is about as much making images out of the data as it is about making a kind of interactive interface for right. looking at the data. What for you is the difference between making images and making the interface for looking at and finding images? In my own work into interfaces, I've arrived at a question about interfaces as being something outside of representation. This of course comes from a distinction between like what we wanna see and what we want to see represented. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. My question for you is, is the interface a form of representation? Yes, well, wonderful question, thank you. Uh, so in general, I want to say, uh, so when I started, when this new media started to develop, right, in 1990s, right, I was very much in the middle of it, right, as a you know, artist, educator, you know, networker, right? Uh, you know, and when I wrote this book, which maybe some of you have seen, Language of New Media, which was like this kind of summary of new media, and one of the things in this book was I had a whole chapter about interface. Because what I kind of decided, realized is that by separating interface from the actual content, from the actual data, right, new media kind of makes it more visible, but it also allows uh, working, it allows kind of working on interface as a separate cultural activity, right? So in a book, in a book or in a movie, right? Or let's say maybe if, you know, right? The interface and content are kind of glued together, right? The book is both the interface and, and the content. Right, and the interface is kind of the same, right? I mean, right, so the books, page numbers, index, etc. But one of the big things about, I think, visual media is that you have separately, you have like data, images, you know, videos, texts, numbers. And when you have interface, right, which is separate, and in fact, you have a third level, which is kind of graphical media rendering, right? So interface, when you think about interface, you can say, what is the functionality of interface, right? So if you're designing a website, Maybe you're designing information architecture, maybe you're designing like what buttons are going to go on the page. Even these buttons can be rendered in a million different ways. So in fact, you have three levels, right? You have a kind of your content or your data. Uh, you have a kind of interface in terms of functionality. Even you have like a kind of scheme, right? Um, so now the question is, right, is interface different from representation or is it representation? Well, to be honest, Yes, but yes and no. So I think the way you're posing the question, it probably would be better to go like a bit less general and maybe start introducing our terms. Uh, because I think if you keep it at this level of generality, it's both yes and no, and here's what I mean, right? So think about the photograph, or like architectural, right, architectural plan. Or it's a representation of something. So photograph representation, something which will be for the camera. A plan can be a representation of existing building, or it can be like a kind of algorithm to design a new building, right? So the representation of something which doesn't exist. So when you create the interface, uh, so when you think about computer interfaces, right? Yes, of course, you know, I can, uh, I can build my phone and I can simply look at the photo and don't do anything. In this respect, it's the same thing as looking at the photo in a photo which was printed. But normally, interface allows for some interactivity, right? So typically, a digital interface allows you to do something. You can zoom, you can, you can, right? you can, you can kind of go up and down the text, you can change your font, uh, you can sort by keywords, you can sort by, so interface allows you right, to perform some actions on the representation. So from this point of view, you can say it's a kind of representation, it's a kind of meta representation or representation representation, like representation slash two, because the representation typically used to be static, right? 
So whatever you chose to represent, you fix it, right? Like I'm making architecture drawing. I'm making a plan. I'm taking photograph, you know, and I fix it, right? Uh, and now it's fixed. The interface allows you, right? Bring some additional functionality. And some functionality can be very minimal, like zooming in, or it can be, right, doing something dramatic, right? So Photoshop is also interface. I can load photograph in Photoshop. I can make it black and white, and so on and so forth, right? So interface allows a whole kind of, right, a whole kind of universe of functionality, uh, and it makes representation, I don't know, it can, so it can make representation more informative, more rich, and also it allows you in theory, right, to manipulate it, to change it, and to do something else to it. So, uh, so, and finally, you can say, so on the one hand, it's not representation, right? It's something that changes the representation. On the other hand, you can say it's, it's a kind of second degree representation, right? So, we, so the representation is like a sign, right? Like a kind of signifier. We can say interface is like a, it's a sign on top of a sign. If, if you want to do a semiotic, for example, right? So something like this. <laughs> I don't know if it made sense, but you know. Yeah, so, so in a way you can talk about both representational node and actually both, I think both things were useful, but I, I think it's more useful to talk about there's something else to foreground that in fact is doing something different, you know? Um, I had another question actually, and it's more general. Um, I enjoy your lecture a lot. I was actually wondering, um, I guess the bigger question that I'm thinking about is like there's a lot of talk about the dependency we have on Instagram and on a lot of these devices and things, what do you feel is like the future of this right. technology, specifically Instagram and the future of kind of right. uh, yeah. our dependency psychologically? I mean, you've been able to sure, observe sure. a lot of this. Sure. sure, sure, sure. So you notice that, you know, I don't talk about any of it because that's what everybody else talks about, right? Uh, meaning that, uh, you know, and again, there's nothing wrong. I think dependencies do exist. Yeah, but lots of young people who like right spend all the time playing video games. Uh, you know, maybe 10, 10, 20 years ago it was just particular subculture you know, in Japan. You know, with people right who stay home can look at look at manga, but now it became a phenomenon, and uh, with selfish culture is very really big. You know, some you go to a cafe right in, uh, you know, you go to one of five hundred thousand cafes in Seoul. Yeah, and you always find a couple of girlfriends who come at 11 a.m. and stay until 11 p.m. and all we're doing is taking selfies, right? It's, it's not just dependency, it's like, it's like lifestyle, right? Mm -hmm. uh, well, I think that like this, right? So every technology, every complex technology can be used in all kinds of different ways, right? Um, so to me, the kind of positive uses of social media, right? Overweight negative ones, like without in fact, about Instagram and Facebook, it will be much harder to exist during pandemic. But these dependencies do exist. So I think uh, the question, but, but let's, let's talk about your question. What will, happen, what will happen in the future? So I'm lucky to be observing digital culture for around 35 years, right? So I started work in this kind of company in 84. Yeah, it's actually 36 years. So this gives me a bit of advantage because I can think about this long terms. And what I think is that if you think about this 35 years, a particular kind of new technology comes out, or maybe I should put it, a particular new technology gets into the market. And during the first five, 10 years, there's lots of changes, right? Lots of different companies. And then it kind of gets like you know, solidified, even it doesn't change. So, you know, uh, Photoshop, uh, uh, Adobe Premiere, right? InDesign came out between 87 and 92. If you look at interface of Photoshop version one, it, yes, there is millions of functions, but it's kind of the same. And for example, the idea of image, you know, image has a layers, right, in, in Photoshop. Well, that was already like 94, right? Uh, so if I look at social media, here's what I think, right? So the social media develops like late 90s, so already around 2000, there are social networks in Asia, people share images, Flickr is 2004, MySpace and YouTube 2005, but in terms of users, it kind of takes off around 2007, but in developed countries. In developing countries, as we found out from our Twitter project, it's about 2011, 2012. So now you have like 4 billion people using it. And it became like very kind of, like I would say, very static. We didn't really see, we don't really see any major changes on YouTube or Facebook, right? Uh, Instagram maybe a bit more for maybe already 10 years. 
like Facebook interface, right? It's terrible, but we don't, we can't change it because we're afraid people, people will be lost. So in some ways, social media is very dynamic, and now social media is more static today than television, you know? Sometimes there's more innovation than television. Uh, and because it is used, right, by kind of 4 million, 4 million people, because this company is so big, I don't think we're going to go away tomorrow, right? It's like a Ford, right? Ford has been around for how much? 100, 110 years. Now, it doesn't mean that we're all going to stay here in 10 years from now, but when you think about it, these big companies, which all already became big by late 2000, the only one which kind of went down was basically MySpace, right? So Facebook, Twitter, Instagram is still here. Now it's possible, but of course, Facebook would be broken by, you know, by, by, you know, by, by the state, right? Because we'll say it's monopoly. Uh, but, uh, so, but I think it's unlikely, right? So in a way, uh, I feel very unhappy. Because what I think is that we had this period of new media innovation around 1990 to around 2007. Interactive multimedia, you know, virtual reality, web, you know, ta 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 And then I think what happens is there's this crisis. Now I'll talk about crisis. So when you think about the crisis, 2008, 2009, so people lost jobs, right? Uh, the jobs didn't recover for like five, six years. And, you know, what happens in the moment of crisis? Lots of like small innovative entities go out of business. People want security. People want maybe a job at a good big company. So from my point of view, the culture came out after the last crisis a bit more commercial, in some ways a bit less innovative than before. And this period of innovation has ended, and I think was much more focused on commercializing with platforms, et cetera, et cetera. So what I'm really afraid, yes, the crisis, you know, putting people out of jobs is going to destroy families, it's terrible. But Absolutely. But from a cultural perspective, what I'm afraid is that this economic crisis, which is coming, right? I'm afraid it can make culture even a bit more commercial, a bit less experimental. And it's kind of your job, you, it's, guys, your, it's your job to help fight it a little bit, uh, which means that, you know, uh, I don't think Facebook is going to change everything dramatically. I think Winter Facebook can stay the same, right? Perhaps. Uh, so, uh, and again, I'm not saying there is no innovation, right? Uh, suddenly everybody starts using Zoom. Well, I mean, that's a new, not new idea. Uh, people were used, doing video teleconferencing for decades, but then suddenly you have lots of institutions, you know, architecture schools, like all kinds of places who start doing classes on Zoom and lectures on Zoom. It's a new thing, right? It's a new use of technology. And what I'm really hoping is I don't have to go back to New York because well, Elena maybe loves New York. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm gonna have this life hate relationship. I can just stay in Korea and I can be a virtual professor. I could be hired by some university and just teach on Zoom, right? Why do I have to go somewhere, right? The way I'm doing, doing now. So, um, so I know that I kind of went to lots of different places. Maybe I didn't answer your question uh, because your question was about dependency. Uh, I, don't have, I don't have a good answer, you know? I don't have a good answer. Uh, but I guess I'm just maybe kind you of have. Yeah. No, no, I don't think I do either. <laughs> but I okay. think um, it's, a, I feel like it's very easy to be cynical about it. And that's a lot of what we hear a lot is like, uh, we're so dependent, we're so dependent, blah, blah, blah. Um, but there can also be a lot of positive out of it too. So I was just wondering like what your take was. Yeah, I feel well, like my, really... my, yeah, sure, sure. Well, my take is, you know, when you look at kind of popular culture, but also what I call high, what I call high culture. You know, for me, high culture is not ballet, ballet opera. For me, high culture is like Sayak and UCLA, and means architecture being added, right? That's, that's what I call high culture today, right? Architects writing is very sophisticated, hard to read text, right? So the high culture and pop culture were not so different in terms of how we understand the world. So 20 years ago, internet was new for people, and people were projecting very kind of utopian ideas on the internet. So internet is going to make us more equal, more horizontal, ta ta ta. Why, why it has to do it? It's just a thing. Well, it didn't really happen. And then 20 years later, people forget that there is internet, people forget there are blogs. So they like to talk about Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, etc. And because of the big companies, people in a high culture have this idiotic idea that big companies are evil because capitalism is evil, right? Uh, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So, so we automatically only look for negative, right? So the same people who 20 years ago would write super positively about uh, internet, now we write about negatively. I never wrote positively or negatively, I just look at it. Maybe that's why my books are still being read. 
Uh, and uh, I think, yes, I think with dependency that definitely exists. But I think that, uh, think about city. Is cities bad or cities are good? They're both, right? Yeah, the cities create pollution, ta ta ta. At the same time, we're actually uh, more environmentally friendly, right? Because everything is focused on one area, right? So, so just as you can't say about the city is it bad or good, I think it's also hard to say is Instagram good or bad, right? Is Zoom good or bad? It's everything, right? The society has wonderful people, the society has criminals, and all these people go <laughs> to social media and do their stuff, right? So I think it's important to pay attention to both. But because so much of like so much of take on uh, social media today is negative, uh, I'm kind of like I like to always take position different from everybody else. I try to focus on positive just to be different. But also as an immigrant who came to America right with nothing, and as somebody who does lots of work in Russia today, and I, I go to lots of developing countries, I think particularly in developing world, I mean social media is so important. I mean you have whole countries where all video art exists only on YouTube. Right? I mean, you have countries where, you know, where there are no academic journals, so academic communication takes place on Facebook. So we have to remember, right, that Facebook and other platforms play, play all the different roles. It's like a library, newspaper, research center, art gallery at the same time, right? Uh, so that's why I find this discourse about dependency. To me, it, it's just one-sided. Yeah. Great, we are at 5.52 and I believe that all our TZ students uh, will in eight minutes tune into our Instagram movie night. <laughs> so, we still have seven minutes. We still have seven minutes. If somebody has um, at least a thank you or a last question or a curiosity to ask. Uh, Elena, to maybe you have something, no? I... I do. Yeah. Um, but I think it's an open another half an hour discussion. <laughs> well, I mean, uh, maybe, maybe, maybe what I can do say. Do you think? Is, okay. So do, you go think, go ahead, yeah. do you think social media has democratized culture? And if yes, did it democratize taste in architecture? Uh, okay. okay. Well, I asked my question. Okay, that's like that's like that's like okay. We just we just we just we just go to go schedule another Zoom meeting, right? I know. Well, so, okay, so one of the things which really interests me a lot is taste, is taste, right? Uh-huh. And uh, how, so maybe some of you know about this famous work by uh, Pierre Bardieu. Uh-huh. Who is like, uh, who is like the most, the mo who is after Marx, the most quoted social scientist in, in the world, right? So Pierre Bardieu, French sociologist. Mm -hmm. He's author of famous book Distinction, where he claimed in 1970s that, again, we think of taste as something very individual. But in fact, taste is determined by social class. And his idea was taste kind of like, in a way like mass and justify your kind of social privileges. Today, things are a bit more difficult, right? Mm -hmm. For example, everybody has iPhone. You can be a billionaire and you can be just like, you know, like you can be just a work in China, you have your iPhone, right? So, so I think one thing which happened in the last 20 years is there is democratization of design, right? 20 years ago, there was like one design hotel in LA. You know, like standards, right? Now, I mean, you go to, I mean, you go to, I mean, okay, yeah. I mean, America, in America, still, you don't have so much contemporary architecture, as you know, right? But I mean, you go to Korea, but every cafe has like three level, three stories, minimalist, amazing building, right? Uh, so every hotel is design hotel. So what used to be kind of high culture, now it became mass culture, right? And with what I call it, with kind of friendly, kind of consumer minimalism, right, with exposed, exposed, right, exposed kind of like, a, you know, concrete walls, has really become a new architectural style, right, a new, a new global, global style. So I think that uh, we can say modern architecture, or particular aesthetics of modern architecture, have become much more democratic, right, we're much more global. Again, you don't really see much in California where like, we're still building all these developments from this kind of right, new Spanish buildings, which is kind of strange. But you do see it in a more progressive country, right? Now, uh, so what I want to say is this. I don't know about Instagram. But, you know, uh, I'm in a career. And one of the reasons I like career, it's a kind of contemporary culture. So every Korean city, not only Seoul, there are thousands of cafes. Basically, every 200 meters is a cafe. Because people spend their lives in cafes, right? We, you know, they, they work, you know, they chat, they study. 
Like people don't start. Yes, you also have Starbucks, you know, and now in the last few years, there are some cafes in LA, but not as many, right? So basically, cafe is like where people spend their time. All the cafes are beautiful, very well designed. We're kind of minimalist, but that doesn't mean anything because there's hundred types of minimalism. So I do think that with democratization of design, which happens at least in some countries, they've also democratized and gave people more of an appreciation for contemporary architecture. Of course, Asia is different because Asia always had this kind of minimalism, right? Stone garden. Uh, but in general, uh, I think that through uh, certain forms, right? I mean, you have more modern architecture, right? I mean, also if you look, for example, at, uh, also I think, for example, if you look at the Scandinavia residential, but people are still building with ugly, right, 80s glass skyscrapers. Uh, now you can say, is social media, did social media have any effect on that? That's an interesting question, right? That's a long discussion, right? Uh, I mean, obviously it's clear that social media allows people to like follow celebrities and follow and follow music and follow fashion and people today right get lots of people today I think get lots of our taste right not by kind of following particular people right so that's why we have all these micro celebrities uh, who teach people what to eat how to eat you know how what to cook right how to exercise but are there any are there any kind of popular blogs which teach people about architecture I've never seen actually so maybe some students can do it, actually. That can be a very useful thing to do, you know, as <laughs> a future job. I, I truly wanted to know. Yeah, no, 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 this yeah, question yeah. came to mind so because big, I thought... So big question, big question, right? I thought, did, did Instagram change the openness towards colors? I mean, did it change so much the perception also in architecture that now we have, there is a taste of more colorful buildings? I mean, the fact that everybody takes a picture against a certain oh, architecture yes, yes, that is colorful. Let's, let's so throw, yes. I wanted you to prove yes. it, but I think you cannot anymore download data no, 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 from, but, you know, from Instagram. There so. have, have been some articles uh, about it, you know, and there are definitely, there are definitely people made this connection. Uh, uh, and definitely in some cities, you have particular kind of Instagram corners. Like for example, right, again, like in, you know, in places like Seoul, you have your Instagram corners. But, you know, uh, if you look at our cities, right, the, the modern architecture is like, most cities is like 1% or something, right? I mean, most is concrete buildings from 20th century, which are all ugly because concrete doesn't age well. Uh, so I think that it probably had some effect on some places. Maybe it had some effect on mall design, right? Uh, maybe it had some effect of, but again, I think it's also very, very regional. So in some places, you see lots of color. If you know Korea, like Asian in general, it's about 100 shades of gray, right? So you basically, you, you're not going to see a single person wearing color in Korea. All the cars are white and black. So there's such a strong kind of monochrome culture, the culture of small differences that, uh, you know, yeah, there are maybe one cafe with color in Seoul, even a million cafes which are, which are black and white, right? Uh, so I think it had some effect for sure. But this effect may be stronger, weaker, depending on the kind of regional taste and the kind of regional culture, you know, I think. Okay, yeah, so this Lev, was my, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Lev, I, yeah, I, on that, I just wanted, wanted to quickly ask, do you think Instagram is allowing, or platforms like it, is it allowing taste to blur even an urban rule binary or blur that distinction? So, 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 okay, uh, so, sorry, say it again. Uh, well, by, because what, 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 yeah, what binary? If, if, if between urban and rural, you know, it's really, ah, you know, uh -huh, culture, uh -huh. but really more stark, yep. you know, as Instagram. Sure, sure, no, understand. Yeah, well, again, I mean, guys, every question is fantastic. Uh, so I, I can give <laughs> okay. you, yeah, but I can, I can actually have some data, data answer. And again, my data, the data which we have, right, it's like 2012, 2000, yeah, 2012, 2016, but then we also, yeah, so it's not recent, but so here's what we found, right? You know, so, you know, in architecture, urbanism, you have measures of density, right? How many people live, the density, right? So, you know, what is a city, what's a country? Well, it's basically not a binary, right? It's basically city, you know, we can call something city when the density number, right, reaches a particular threshold, right? I mean, that's one way to do it. I mean, you can say there are other ways to do it about some, some functions in the city, that that. Well, so when we started looking at geographic distribution, with millions of Instagram images and millions of, and millions of Twitter images we downloaded or got from Twitter. 
the proportion between kind of city, what, it, what we could call city country, is much, it seems to be higher than proportion of population. Right? So now words, it's, it's, I mean, again, this is obviously a very big generalization. We have to look at the data, maybe I'll go now and measure it, but it does seem to be like urban phenomena. Uh, of course, you know, um, much more urban than not. Uh, why? That's an interesting question. Uh, because in, in theory, right, in theory, there shouldn't be any reason for that, right? And again, you know, I, I, what I'll do is I'll maybe go back and measure it, maybe I'll post it, but if you just simply map it out, right? Like if I can show you like maps we have done, like the cities really come out and outside of cities there's like nothing, right? Uh, you can also see it, for example, was a very famous project in 2010, Tourists and Locals by Eric Fisher. So Eric Fisher made this maps of 144 cities with some Flickr. Eric Fisher, Tourists and Locals. So he mapped, uh, he kind of mapped locations of Flickr images in 144 cities. And he used some predictive modeling, very simple, to predict the images taken by tourists or by locals. And he kind of shows these images of New York or Paris or LA only made from locations of photographs. And you can see what even like in the city itself, big regions are completely absent. Right? So in New York, uh, it, it has to do, as I found out, because the same area is more affluent. Uh, it has uh, tourists and also that's where everybody goes to work. Right? That's why this more less affluent part of New York, it's only visible on Instagram at night, but it's not visible during the day. Right? So that's another interesting thing. You also have this kind, of, but in LA the patterns maybe would be different, right? Uh, because LA doesn't really have its midtown like in New York, right? Um, so I think that in general it does seem to be urban phenomena, but even within the city, with lots of variability, depending on kind of where people spend their time, and um, Kind of what we do and uh, right, the kind of work and life patterns. Fantastic. Um, Lev, we have had a lot of your time. It's over two hours. Thank you for your generosity, your uh, intellectual capacity, and for showing us and sharing with us your thoughts. Um, thank everybody for the amount of time you spent on this. Uh, we're now moving to Florencia's Instagram, um, and so maybe she can present to you right now. And so we will move to the next event of the evening. Thank you, Lev. Thank, Thank you, you Lev. Much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. So much. Well, I'm, hoping, I'm hoping that you know you guys will do uh, make some amazing projects, which do use Instagram and stories and so on, uh, because I actually haven't seen any like architecture students using it. So you can do something amazing, I'm sure. And, uh, you know, whatever else happens in your life, make our world more different, celebrate uniqueness. Uh, and, uh, you know, if you happen to make good architecture, you know, that's good, but mostly be a good, creative, open person. So see you thank guys you. one day in physical space. Thank you, John. Lev, I wanted to thank you for your amazing mo mood, you know, for bringing such happiness to all our students. So thank you so much. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you. Great. So I will close the session and I'll see you guys on Instagram. Bye. <laughs> bye bye. Ciao.